Welcome, everyone. This is Steve Adubato. This is the Leadership Hour. Every Sunday at 2 p.m. on AM 970, we come to you sharing valuable leadership tips and tools and advice. We also ask some challenging questions about all aspects of leadership that have me thinking or rethinking how I view leadership, but also the young lady here in the studio with me every week thinking as well, Mary Gamba, my yes. colleague of 18 years. Yes, it's been a long and fun journey, that's for sure. A lot you of say leadership. long and painful journey? <laughs> fun. Fun, fun. Fun journey, yes. A lot of leadership lessons learned throughout the way. And what, by the way, what we do before we're joined by our friend Pete Taft live here in studio, what were we just saying about the leadership hour and how quickly it goes? Just that it's fun and it goes to show you if you do something that you love, you don't have to work a day in your life because you are doing something that you're passionate about it and that you enjoy. So it's pretty cool. And if you are liking what you're hearing on the radio today, you can also go back and hear our previous editions of Steve Adubato's Leadership Hour through How? our podcast. How is this done? It is by this miraculous thing called a podcast, and you can subscribe on Apple iTunes or Google Play. And of course, if you like what you hear, you can give us a good rating while you're there. So we have a podcast? We do, and we also wow. have a Facebook account as well. Amazing. And yes, they can follow us there, Steve Adubato, PhD, and that's A-D-U-B-A-T-O. Yes, it is. And then on Twitter, Steve Adubato, and we have a lot of free stuff on our our website. And what would our website be, Mary? Oh, I'm very happy that you asked, Steve. And our website is stand-deliver.com. <laughs> I almost said Steve Adubato because we did not incorporate your name in our website, unfortunately. We well, but... I just enjoy hearing my name. Yes. A lot. Yeah. So that's stand-deliver.com. And you know, I could tell on the other end of the phone that our friend Pete Taft wanted to laugh or mock us as he was listening because he's like, I can't believe still. How did, how did you know? I was how like, hey, Pete's like, is Adubato still doing this? Yeah, um, we are. And now he's pulled me into it, Pete. I know. So we're joined by our good friend, Pete. We always promise people that we're going to have a great leader sharing great advice and tips and tools because you'd be tired of listening to me doing it. So our great friend, Pete Taft, who is the co-founder and managing partner of Taft, Communications, one of the uh, state of New Jersey's oldest, that's about 35 years, yeah. organization, one of the most respected communications firms. And also, P. Taft, recently with our good friends and colleagues at NJ Biz, was selected for the Icon Award, which means that Pete has accomplished an awful lot of great things in his career. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing great, Steve. Thanks. And thanks, Mary, as well. By the way, tell everyone what the Icon Award is. Yeah, it's an award given out by NJ Biz, as you said, for leaders who have given 20 years or more of their <laughs> of their life and their blood to the state of New Jersey, running businesses, running organizations. And I was honored to be one of, I think, 30 of them this year. Yep. And it was great. It was a real honor. By the way, Taft Communications, tell everyone how they can find out more about Taft Communications, Pete. Sure, Website. it's easy. www.taftcommunications.com. As Steve said, about 35 years we like to say helping organizations and their leaders address the right message to the right audience, uh, marketing, public relations, advertising, and that's how you get a hold of us. So let's jump right into this, Pete. Uh, Pete and I have known each other for many, many years. We were introduced uh, to each other by a great leader, a great friend who uh, unfortunately passed away a few years ago, the former chairman of our board at the Caucus Educational Corporation, which in fact Pete serves on the great Ray Bramucci, who talk about leaders. Ray had one of these great leadership traits of, quote, in Italian, it's called a mashad. You know what that is, Pete? <laughs> I don't. You know what, Mary, do you well, know? Well, I don't know what it is either. You so know what I'm Irish, is? so I do not know what that a is. A mashad in Italian is bringing people together. Aww. Usually it was around a marriage, but in this case, it was a relationship. Talk about that real quick. I know this wasn't on our agenda, Pete, but sure. the skill of, quote, bringing people together, which Ray Bramucci was great at. Yeah, and I'm with you. I think about Ray's literally every day. And I will tell you that an awful lot of what I do and what I've done in my career has been based on what I watched and saw when I worked for Ray as communications director. Ray had the capacity to accept everyone where they were right at the moment, whether you were Republican, Democrat, whether you were with him or against him, never lost his cool. I think I saw him lose his cool once in maybe 15 years, treated everyone with respect. And he had the most important thing for a leader. And that's, we've heard it before. He had emotional intelligence. He could read the room. He could read you. He knew when to crack a joke. He knew when to get serious. So uh, if that's, what did you call it, Mashad? Is that yes, right? a Mashad. Yeah. If that describes Mashad, that was Ray 
in spades. Well, you know what's interesting? I'm sure most people listening don't know who Ray was. Ray was a former commissioner of commerce in the state of New Jersey and also in the Clinton administration, was the number two top leader. He was the under secretary of Yeah, he was the Secretary of Labor. Labor. He actually was the Commissioner of Labor in New Jersey, but he worked closely with Commerce. And he was an advisor to Governor Florio. And as you know, before that, he was an advisor and leader in uh, Senator Bradley's office. So he was experienced. And and by the way, not college educated. In high school education, blue collar guy came out of the unions and just learned as he lived. And as I said, I, I learned while watching him. It's interesting. Yeah, Ray was also the head of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union Correct. Uh, early on. Correct. Pete, let's follow up on this. It's interesting. So you give advice to, get paid for, helping leaders understand about branding, communication, public relations, and all related topics. How often do you find leaders who you work with are like, listen, I already know what to do. I don't really need you. <laughs> You know, the good news, not very many. If they're calling me or they, my first question to them is always, why do you think I'm sitting? And they will confess that there's some deficiency or some weakness that they have or their organization has. It is really, really rare. I would say 5% or less of the time that someone comes in and says, I know what I'm doing. I will say that happens a little more in the political arena, but you have to have a pretty big ego to be out there, right? Getting votes and pushing your cause. But they settle down and they listen. And, and most leaders are smart enough to know they can learn from guys like you and guys like me. So l- let's uh, follow up on the communication piece. Um, yeah. At Stand and Deliver, as Pete well knows, and Mary's been <clears throat> with me shoulder to shoulder for uh, 18 years, we coach people around communication, presentation skills. Pete's firm has been doing that for a long time as well. And by the way, your annual event is wonderful. I, it's inspirational. I'm sorry I missed it this year, but or will miss it, but it's a good organization. Thank you for doing what you do. Thank you. And by the way, Pete's making reference to our not-for-profit version of Stand and Deliver, where we coach and mentor young people disproportionately in the city of Newark, but in other urban areas as well, in terms of their leadership and communication skills. But Pete, here's what I'm curious about. A whole range of CEOs, of leaders that you work with, for a whole variety of reasons, don't communicate well in public. They talk too long. They're not concise. Their message is not clear. They use jargon and don't even follow whether their audience is following them or not. And I'm not saying across the board, but I'm saying you and I have seen it a lot. How the heck do they get to be leaders and not have those basic communication skills, Pete Taft? Well, a couple of reasons. Number one, you get promoted. You get promoted because you're good at something and then you get up to vice president, maybe up to CEO, and it doesn't necessarily follow that you're good at motivating people or communicating. So that's number one. And that, I call that leadership dress up. You know, you're the vice president or you, you're wearing a mortar board and I'm the leader. It doesn't mean you're communicating well. So that's one way. The, the, the other is through sheer power. And we see a lot of that now, particularly on the political front. But I don't want to address that. I don't think it necessarily follows that if you are a leader, that you're already skilled in the art and craft of communication. And that's where I come in. That's where you come in. I like to say that we can give leaders with good intent, good heart, good focus, open nature, we can give them the additional skills of being precise, better, and more persuasive communicators. You know, there's another aspect of communication I find fascinating. Mary and I have talked about this a lot. One of the chapters in my book, Lessons in Leadership, which, by the way, you can check out our website, stand-deliver.com, if you want to get a copy of it, is uh, great leaders take responsibility when things go wrong. Pete, you have had to, forget about communication right now, you have had to talk to leaders directly, advise them to take the hit, take responsibility, own it, don't blame anybody else, don't finger point, and don't scapegoat, correct? Yep. If I have the full trust of that leader, then it's a moral argument that I try to make, and they listen to it. I don't know if they always act on it, but they will hear me 100%. More often than not, it's me and their team persuading them. They they may feel that they don't have to take responsibility, that there's a better way to say something, that we could blame it on the vendor or whatever it is. <laughs> but, yeah, but ultimately, if I or the team can be persuasive and make the moral argument, 
they'll accept responsibility. I honestly can't think of anyone I've ever worked with. Well, I, I can actually think of one who dodged responsibility that was very clear, and we resigned. I resigned. My firm resigned. We didn't want to deal with that duplicity. So one in what? 1,500, 2,000 cases? Wow. We're talking to Pete Taft, uh, the co-founder and managing partner of Taft Communications, uh, recently won the uh, Icon Award at, at the great publication NJ Biz, a good friend of ours, one of our board members at our production company, our, the Caucus Educational Corporation. Pete, I'm curious about this before I let you go. One of the books that I wrote before this one on leadership was called What Were They Thinking? Uh, about crisis communication, <laughs> and, and, and it is good filled. Good title, by the way. It is, I'm going to thank the folks at Rutgers University Press for helping to come up with that. But what's fascinating about it, because Mary worked with me, again, shoulder to shoulder on that book and all of them, was that book is filled with examples of leaders who did not or could not and refused to take responsibility over yeah. real major screw-ups. So what I'm fascinated by is... Uh, by the way, one of the people in the book at BP, the guy who was the CEO of BP when the oil spill happened. Oh, sure. He was like, it ain't me. Well, it's not me. And by the way, this is keeping me up at night, and I, and I want my life back. I'm like, you want your I life back? I want my life back, right. I want your life back. What about everybody else's life who got screwed up because of what you guys did? Uh, the New York Knicks, there's a chapter about the New York Knicks because mm -hmm. they had uh, Isaiah Thomas um, charged with all kinds of stuff. Yeah, captains Yvonne, who jumped ship, ca remember? Mm -hmm. Captain who jumped ship. The uh, Italian the, cruise uh -huh. liner, right? Costa Concordia. Who was like, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't me, and the, he, but he jumped off the ship and people died. So it's filled with that. You think that's the exception, Pete? Well, in my experience, it is. But I'm fortunate in that we kind of get to choose our clients. Right? So we rarely, if we're presented with a company that's clearly in trouble and has been duplicitous, we'll stay away from it. But if we're faced with a company that's in trouble and we think we can get them out of it, we'll certainly jump in there. I'll tell you what the common trait is among leaders who face the music, and that's courage. 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 They have the courage to say what is true, which is not easy in this world. And by the way, they're being advised by their friends, by their wives. By their lawyers. Born lawyers. <laughs> Don't get me started. I love lawyers. I love them too, but sometimes we disagree as to what needs to be said or not said publicly. Right, and the words that the lawyers often come up with sound like they were pre-baked. Pre mm -hmm. What a leader has to do is speak from the heart and the head, admit something is wrong, say they're going to put it right back on the track again, talk to people. Ray used to say, talk to people like you're at the kitchen table. Hmm. You know, just talk to them. And I never forgot that. My old editor, when I was a reporter, said, Write for the Kansas City Milkman. Write it clear. Write it straight. You know, don't fool around. People know when you're fooling around. The best case study of a leader whose company was in trouble, who faced the music. Are you going to go with J&J? Are you going to J&J? You got it. Uh, Tyler, was it, was it James Kansas. Burke or David Burke? It was James Burke. Thank and you. And I, I actually show that clip at our workshops. And I can tell you, I'm paraphrasing a bit, but he said, this is a problem. We're talking about the Tylenol case involving, and when someone was poisoning, was getting, uh, I don't know what it was in the, in the what was, Yeah, I think it was cyanide, so, that, right? Wasn't it? Yeah. That? Yeah, go ahead, Pete. In yep. Chicago. In Chicago. So he basically said, we, first of all, he got right on the news. He got right away up and said, we know this is a problem. We're facing it. It's going to take time. It's going to cost money, but we will fix it. We own this. We'll fix it. And I have a dear friend, a guy I grew up with in nursery school, who was on his crisis team, who slept in cots in New Brunswick while they were solving the Where problem. Where the corporate office is of J&J. Uh, &J. Yeah. My friend Don slept, I think, five days in a row at J&J, &J, no change of clothes, working on the problem. So that's a company with a great leader. That's a company that owned up. R real quick before I let you go, Pete. That was, I believe, in the 1980s <clears throat> Correct. that it happened. Do you think the J&J &J case involving Tylenol and someone, this whack job or whomever, was injecting the, mm -hmm. uh, the poison into uh, the tablets, do you think it, the way J&J &J would have to handle that from a leadership point of view, crisis leadership point of view, in the age of social media, any different? No. No. Social media, whether it's social media or traditional media, fast media, slow media, you're still talking about truth. You're still talking about courage. You're still talking about conviction. You're talking about 
communicating wow. honestly and forthrightly. That never will change. And people say, oh, my God, you know, we're all addicted to social media. Yeah, we are. And there are problems in that. But there are enormous opportunities for leaders to take advantage of that. To How get, so? To come across who you are. I can do something on YouTube and people can hear me, feel me, understand my words. Visuals are better than just the print, but then I could put it on my web page. I mean, social media gives us 360 degrees worth of communications. And if you are honest, if you're forthright, if you're courageous, all these values we talk about, that's not going to go away. And a good company is going to take advantage of that. Well, that Pete Taft is a smart guy. I know. <laughs> I think we need a uh, Pete Taft leadership hour. Hey, 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 hey. It's, Just Pete's saying. got too many clients. He's got too many responsibilities. He doesn't need this show. <laughs> He's good at it, it's, though. He is good. It's fun. It's fun, guys. And it, you know what? Talking about leadership is, is one of the most crucial discussions we can have in a civic society today. Because you know and I know, you open the paper, you read the web page, there's not a lot of it. It's in short supply. And we've got to breed more leaders with the courage, with conviction, with the ability to communicate. I long for that day. Pete Taft, our good friend, is co-founder and managing partner, Taft Communications, one of the most respected communication firms in the country, not just the state of New Jersey. Pete, thanks, buddy. Thank you very much, Barry. Thank you, Steve. Thank, Thank you. you. I'll look forward to seeing you soon. You got it. Take care. Bye-bye. Pete's good. He's good. Courage. It's interesting. I love when our guests come up with a topic that we have a long list. If anybody could see our list here, it's a, I think it's about seven or eight pages. Both of print. potential topics, you mean? I don't think we have courage written down as a leadership topic, and that's fascinating. I, it's We have other words that we use, but not that word courage. Sure, by the way, you're listening to Mary Gamba. This is Steve Adubato. This is the Leadership Hour. That was Pete Taft, our good friend. Brian Brodeur is uh, running things here on the production side as well. Now, let's talk about courage a little bit. So we often tell our kids, our children, mm -hmm. uh, we want them to have the quote unquote courage to step up and do the right thing. Right. So in school, think about mm -hmm. school or things that happen. Mm -hmm. Easier said than done, A. B, doing the right thing and having courage. Say you're talking about bullying for a second. Yep. I asked my son, one of our sons, if he had ever seen someone be bullied and he was like, yeah. I said, what, do you, what, do you, what have you done? He goes, what do you mean, what have I done? I didn't do it. Mm -hmm. I said, no, no, when you see it, what do you do? And I knew I was making him uncomfortable, but ultimately he struggled with the question, and he finally told me that one of the situations came up is that some of the players on his team were talking about another kid, mm -hmm. and he stepped up, and I don't know if he defended the kid, but he tried to offer a different point of view about the kid, and... But he only went so far because he didn't want the kids turning on him. Right. Does it make any sense? It does. Why it's, is that courage and well, leadership and related? I just saw a similar situation about 24 hours ago. Again, my older, both of my boys play hockey. I was at a hockey tournament with my 16-year-old. And 16-year-olds, as you know, hormones are raging. They've got that whole testosterone thing going on. Needless to say, we were in our sixth fifth game of the weekend. And By the way, Mary does this every weekend yeah, with, with her son. I drive all over the country. It's them. exciting. And uh, of course, as I'm doing it, I'm tuned in to AM 970 the entire time as far as the listening audience can go, of course. When That's I'm right. In that every car. Sunday at 2 p.m. Oh, exactly. So long story short, uh, one of the kids on our team, when uh, they were down probably about five to zero, going coming off the ice from the second to the third period because they have to clean the ice. And all the parents are there. We all see it happen. And one of the kids is blaming another kid for the reason why they're down, which leads to, thankfully, the handful of other leaders on the team. Players, not the coach. Exactly. And the irony is, and I'll get to that in a second, what the coach did and didn't do. And the kids were yelling at him and saying, this is a team. If you're not part of this team. Yelling just, at the kid yep, who, who was blaming, was blaming someone. blaming somebody else. And, and just the day before, he was blaming the goalie for the loss. So, a blamer. Yeah, he's a blamer. Not, not it's a leadership to, trait. Yeah. It's, yeah. And, and obviously, you know, and, and just for the record, this kid didn't happen to score any goals all weekend. So, I mean, you could take that, you know, you could point fingers in both directions. So they all go into the locker room, and there was pushing and shoving. I mean, that's how, really? yeah, pushing and shoving with the with these sixteen year olds and this kid because they were going. You know how guys do; they get their chest to chest, and they still have their helmets on, so they're all got ten pounds of equipment on, twenty pounds of equipment. They all go in the locker room. The door gets closed, and the coach is standing outside of the locker room. And I'm like, Coach, aren't you going to go in there? And you know, 
He's like, no. I said, they're going to work it out. They're going to play as a team. They're going to work this out as a team for better or for worse. Now, we're all hoping that they're going to come out with all their limbs and no bloodshed or anything. And sure enough, they came out. One kid didn't get back on that bench. Is that true? That is true. Did the kids work that out? It's still kind of up in the air of exactly how that happened. But the reality is you need to, and these young, when we go back to Courage, how the conversation started, teaching, and again, it, this show is not about sports, but it's about leadership. No. And I think a lot of leadership traits are gained with our young adult, you know, kids playing sports. Yeah, I'm going to play this out a little bit. I think I talked about this last time we taped. I know I told you about this. Our son was playing, our, our 15-year-old mm -hmm. was playing a, a game, and it was a game I happened to be at a baseball game. And they were beating this team pretty badly, but they didn't mercy them, you know, where they end the game early. But they were, oh, oh, I know what it was. They were tied, and then our son's team scored a bunch of points, a bunch of runs, and they were up. And the first base coach, I told you about this, yeah. the first no, base coach. we did talk about that on the radio okay. as well. But, but the way this the whole thing played out is the other team knew they were going to lose the game. And one of the coaches of the other team basically said to the pitcher to not only throw at the kid on our team, but after the game, I'm not going to use the foul language because we're on mm -hmm. AM 970. I wouldn't use it anyway. Let's mess these guys up. Mm -hmm. But he also said another word, and it meant to be physical. Let's have a fight. Cops came, et cetera, et cetera. There was no incident. And I thought to myself, not, not only did no player say, Coach, what do you, why, why would you, what do you mean, let's mm -hmm. have a fight? We lost the game. But no other coach challenged him. Right. No umpire challenged him. And that's when I opened my mouth and said something which I shouldn't have done as a parent. And things just got out of hand. And it wasn't great that I did that. But what really threw me off was that a person in a leadership position, not a leader, but a person in a leadership position, the head coach of the other team, yelled out something that he wanted the players to do, which was not only unsportsmanlike, but mm -hmm. dangerous and bad, and no one challenged yeah. him. Yeah, exactly. It, and it's and to go scary. back to courage. Yeah. What courage would it have taken? That's This has really been triggered by the Pete Taft yeah. comment about leaders have to be courageous. Because everything translates and builds upon something else. So whether you're a teacher at school and you're teaching these character traits, obviously our kids need to learn math, science, English. They need to learn those. But we hope that what we're teaching and what our teachers are teaching and when our kids go off to college, you hope that they're learning as well. The courage to step How up. How do you learn and courage? You do learn courage by watching others demonstrate it. And that's where the coaching and mentoring of leadership comes in. As leaders, we need to coach and mentor our young adults. We need to coach and mentor the people on our, our work teams. Mm. And we need to lead by example. So by us stepping up and showing courage, hopefully we'll enable them to lead and to step up and be courageous. That's Mary Gamba. I'm Steve Adubato. This is the Leadership Hour. Brian, I'm curious about this as well. Think about this. Um, forget about sports for a second. Think about courage in different industries. We say, you know, you have to have the courage to challenge your colleagues if you know your colleagues are doing something that is either unethical, immoral, simply wrong, hurtful, whatever. Well, let's think about this for a second. How many times do we think teachers know of other teachers who have done something um, that's just plain wrong, treated a kid unfairly, um, been abusive to that kid. Uh, I actually know of a case in one of the local high schools of a family friend of ours who uh, a teacher said some horrific things to a kid, uh, bullied the kid. And, and, and the school system is fortunately dealing with it. I don't believe any other teacher challenged that teacher. How about a physician who does something um, in the operating room or wherever that is mean-spirited, abusive, or uh, unethical or whatever, whether it's a patient or a colleague or whatever. How often do physicians challenge that other physician? Just, it doesn't matter. It could be a teacher. It could be a physician. It could be a lawyer. It could be someone in the media. How, how often did anyone challenge um, one of my former colleagues, Matt Lauer, who worked at another station together? If, say, so, I don't know what happened or didn't happen with Matt Lauer, but something happened. Did anyone have the courage to challenge Matt Lauer? Did anyone have the courage to challenge... Harvey Weinstein? Did anyone have the courage to challenge our former PBS colleague, Charlie Rose? 
who's also at CBS, or 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 or, or um, the the CBS guy just Les Moonves. Les Moonves. Who is the chair? He's the boss. You're going to challenge him. What kind of courage would it take to do that, Brian? I'm putting my job on the line, my career on the line. Really? <laughs> well, I, you know, an element to this, and I think what courage is in perspective with, is fear. Of? So, well, right, whatever. Right, this is Brian Brodeur, who heads up our production operation and leads the organization here every day. That's why I'm pulling him in, because he understands this. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. You know, the other side of the coin, if you have courage, it has to be in perspective to something, right? Yep. You have to be courageous in the face of blank. Consequences. Consequences. And I think the root of that is fear. You have courage in the face of fear of those consequences or fear of reprisal, fear of anything. And that's the case of bullying on a sports team. It's the case of calling out Les Moonves. You name it. So it's interesting about this. Someone once said, and I think they're wrong about this, that leaders are fearless. I think that's garbage. I think leaders, great leaders, mm -hmm. are absolutely afraid. They are afraid of the potential consequences. They don't want those consequences to take place. But in the face of those consequences, they do the courageous thing in spite of that. That's real courageous leadership to me. It's not, oh, that leader is not afraid. You, okay, I guess you are. Right. You wouldn't, Mary. Be, you wouldn't be human if you're not afraid. Now, it was another guest that we had on one of the previous episodes of the Leadership Hour, but he rightfully said you cannot show your fear yes. because then everybody around you will also see that, feel that, and it could create chaos. I mean, if you say you're afraid of the direction the organization is yeah, going in. there's that financial the, problems. Yeah, you're challenged and, financially. Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. The market trends, they're not looking good. Well, you're going to need to be realistic, and you're going to need to share with your team the reality. And uh, we argue about that a lot, not yes. literally, but, you know, it, it's, it's a good question. In our own organization. How much transparency is too much? Because you can't equally say, oh, the sky is falling and want to share that information and put the fear in these people. But then on the flip side, when you have a good day, not share that information. So because then if they think it's too good and they think we're too, you know, too much then in the black, then they're going to start asking. That's for more. financially. Exactly. But or in any way, I mean, you know, say with our nonprofit television production company, oh, the viewership is down or, oh, we lost slots. You know, obviously, if you, you have a show, slots. you broadcast slots, you need to have a place to air this great product right. and if you lose those times you don't have a place to air it so what does that have to do with courage it has to do with the what you were talking about in leaders not being afraid we're all human beings we're going to be afraid but it's how you manage that fear and how you turn it into an opportunity to look inward inside yourself then determine how I can lead my organization forward and really just harness that fear into something greater then because you could also then spiral the opposite way if you just really just overthink that fear. It could become a negative spiral. It's so interesting uh, in the few minutes we have for the Leadership Hour. Leaders, great leaders, the best leaders can have feelings of vulnerability, insecurity, fear. The list goes on. Mm -hmm. My sense is it's a question of what you choose to do with it. It's not whether you feel it, oh, they're always confident. Yeah, really, they are? They, really? I think that's not true. I think it's whether you give in mm -hmm. to the fear, the vulnerability, the insecurity, the pettiness. Yes, we've, it's like saying great leaders never are vindictive. Uh, yeah, you have feelings of wanting to be vindictive. It's are you going to act on it? Correct. Correct. Fear can give you perspective really, and can help you look at the bigger picture and help you make better, wiser decisions of what you're going to do in reaction to that fear. So it's not always a bad thing. Okay. Oh, my God. Uh, we have this, it's no joke, Mary's not, was, she said it earlier, um, we have this obsessively long list of topics. Courage wasn't on that list. That's how we got off on this. And so it leads me to the final topic I want to bring up. Mm-hmm. We have lists, to-do lists. You have them, I have them. A lot of people listening to us on the Leadership Hour have them. Uh, I've often said in my coaching and mentoring of people um, around leadership is, is the following. 
They'll say, oh, I had my to-do list today, and I only did three things of the 10 I had. And I often say, and so therefore, and they'll say, well, it wasn't a good day because I only did three of the 10 things. And my response is this, um, which three were they? What, what do you mean, which three? Which three did you do? Well, the top three. Why did you do? Well, because there's one, two, and three. And here's the point. Strategic leadership is about looking at that list and asking of the 10. And to Stephen Covey in his book, First Things First, he really triggered this in me. It was a question not just of time management, of prioritizing. Of those 10 items, which one, two, or three, in what order do you need to do them first? And why is it today that you need to do them? Because if you don't do them today, if you don't do it today, nothing else matters. So I'm a big believer in not just to-do lists, but of strategically designed to-do lists. Go, Mary Gamba. Yeah, I agree. I Because I, I know have, you have lists. I have lists, and I have lists for every aspect of my left. life. And just having that list, as you said, is important, keeping it in an organized way, but then doing, I like to call it triage, similar as they do in an emergency room when a patient goes in and sure, they've got a cut, One guy's got a broken, broken leg, a woman's having a heart attack. Go what ahead. is most important? You need to understand what needs to be done now and whatever doesn't need to be done now, you also need to put it not only off of your list or at least on the side of your list for the day, but out of your mind. Because if you don't, then you're not gonna be fully present on whatever number you're working on on your list. You need to be present on that, don't let your mind think about the 10 other things that aren't getting done, and then you'll do a better job at completing whatever task that is that you're working on. Have you gotten better at this over time? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I've always been good at being organized. Even back in high school, I learned it then, and it just really helps with time management. By the way, we, one of our uh, young associates who just came on board uh, for a few months, you want to say her name? Uh, who are you? Well, Michaela. are you talking about Michaela? That's how this whole conversation came what, what up. Because Michaela is terrific. She's at the end of the day, she puts a, yeah, she puts a list together of the first things first that she has to do the next day. So this way, not only is she not going to think about it on her car ride home or when she's laying in bed, what didn't I do? She already has that written down. So then you could think about and focus on something else. And by the way, she's a millennial. And so all the people who say, oh, millennials, they're, they're social media obsessed and they, 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 they're this, they're that. No, we got about five millennials who are superstars. Mm -hmm. And it's not us, it's, it's them. It's not us. I don't know what generation we are. That's okay. Um, hey, listen, the Leadership Hour, once again, goes by very quick. At least the first half hour does. The second half hour is State of Affairs with Steve Adubato. Check it out. Uh, I want to thank my colleague, Mary Gamba, Brian Brodeur. Uh, another great show. Mary, say goodbye. Yeah, thank you so much, Steve. It's been fun. Say goodbye. Goodbye. See you next week. This is Mary Gamba. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with State of Affairs with Steve Adubato, where we look at the most pressing issues facing the state of New Jersey. This edition of the Steve Adubato Leadership Hour has been made possible by New Jersey Resources. At Englewood Health, we believe that all citizens need to be informed about the health care issues that affect their lives. That's why we're proud to support important health care programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Agnes Veris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway. Funding has been provided by Englewood Health, the Northward Center, Rowan University, Educating New Jersey leaders, partnering with New Jersey businesses, transforming New Jersey's future. New Jersey Resources, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, founded by the Jewish community. MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey. And by International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825. Welcome to State of Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato coming to you from the Agnes Varis NJ TV studio in Newark. I'm going to introduce two very special guests. Ed Richardson, Executive Director of the New Jersey Education Association, and his colleague, Marie Bliston, President of the New Jersey Education Association, 200,000 members mm -hmm. strong. Correct, Marie? Yes, that's absolutely correct. Not just teachers? No. Who we else? have teachers, child study team, librarians, nurses, custodians, bus drivers, cafeteria workers, maintenance, How long is security this personnel, go on? secretaries, <laughs> for as long as it takes to answer that question. That's a yeah. lot. All of the essential yeah. people we need to run our yes. public schools. Wow, it, it's absolutely true. By the way, I always say this, and every educator, public school educator, comes on. Thank you, all of you, 
uh, for everything you do for our children and other children every day. Um, yeah, we're talking about a whole range of substantive important issues, mm -hmm. and let me disclose the NJA, a major underwriter of the work that we do in public broadcasting, and as you know, a big supporter of public broadcasting. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious about this. As we do this program, and uh, toward the later and uh, latter end of September, there's just been a deal struck between the Governor Murphy administration mm -hmm. and public employee workers having to do with, help me on this if I'm wrong, renegotiating uh, health and pension benefits, saving the state a significant amount of money. Set this up for us. So not pension benefits, but... Uh, Only health. Right. Uh, State-provided health insurance. Um, our members are in a program called the School Employees Health Benefits Program. Uh, other public employees are in another state health benefits program. So this was on the school employee side. Hold on. Communication Workers of America, they have a different... They're in the State, state Employees health. health Benefits Got it. Program. Okay. There are design committees of both of those programs, and those design committees have equal representation from uh, unions and from the administration. Uh, that design committee for the school employees program got together just yesterday and agreed to uh, changes that will, in total, save the state about $470 million over two years. How does it save it? Explain it. Um, basically, there were a whole uh, variety of changes that were put in place to um, uh, really improve the way that care is delivered without diminishing the level of care. The big one is on the retiree side, I will say. Uh, having to do with um, the uh, post-retirement medical benefits for Medicare-eligible retirees. Uh, the state bid and got a very attractive bid from uh, Aetna for a program that uh, is a Medicare Advantage program, but a much better Medicare Save Advantage money. program. Yep. Oh, yeah. Marie, let me ask you this. We had uh, State Assemblyman John Bramnick, who mm -hmm. had the Republicans in the lower house. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know what, that's a good thing. It's a step in the right direction. But, quote, it's not saving nearly enough, you say. I say that we have come to the table whenever we have been invited to find the best affordable health care, quality health care for our members. So this is the deal that could be struck at this point. How about if someone said go further? Well, you Ask know, I more think... more of public employees, you I, say? I, I think people have to remember that we did go further. Mm -hmm. um, Back in 2011? Uh, no, not even. A couple of years ago, we came to the state and said, you know what? We've done some research. We believe that the way that the state is bidding the prescription benefits in these programs uh, could be dramatically improved. They took our advice. There was legislation that needed to be passed to allow that bidding to change. And as a result, they are saving $1.6 billion, with a B, dollars over three years on just the prescription benefits. So these are examples of what we can accomplish when we work together, when we have an honest broker on the other side of the table, when we are, are getting the information that we ask for, providing the information they ask for. Uh, this is what we can accomplish together. Marie, let's talk. By the way, we're talking to Ed Richardson and Marie Bliston from the New Jersey Education Association, Steve Adubato, State of Affairs. Question. Mm -hmm. uh, the Murphy administration, working closely with them, it's no secret that your organization worked hard to uh, help get the governor elected. In terms of the governor's proposals and his initiatives around, around school funding, mm -hmm. funding the school, state school formula, where are we and are we not where we need to be? Steve, we are in such a much better place today than what we were a year ago. I cannot underestimate that. We were living under eight years of underfunding by the prior governor to the tune of close to and $9 billion. You can't just respectfully remember. It's not just exactly the, the governor. Right. It was the legislature Both. as well. Both. But it does start at the top with an attitude and with a vision. And Governor Murphy promised us uh, during his campaign that he was very supportive of public education and he would make sure that that support turned into actions if he were uh, elected. And How's the dialogue different, Marie? Well, first of all, there is dialogue. We have been invited to the table. We have been invited to speak with him and his administration on all the matters that pertain directly to our members who are working in our classrooms, our school buses, cafeterias every single day. You know, one of the other issues that's important, and actually we were, I was just uh, telling Ed and Marie that we, the Commissioner of Education was scheduled to be here today. There was a scheduling conflict. He will be joining us. Jackie Heyer, our executive producer, is going to make sure that happens. Our team is going to bring the Commissioner of Education. Why do I raise it? Because there's another issue that's important to all of us who happen to have children in, in public schools, the park test, mm. standardized park test. Mm -hmm. um, a few years ago, hey, this test has to be done. We have to know how our kids are doing. And we have to tie those results to how we pay teachers and how we evaluate teachers. Where are we today on that? And why is the commissioner of education so important, Ed? 
Well, you raised the connection to teacher evaluation, and the commissioner under the law does get to establish the uh, percentage of a teacher's evaluation that's attributable to student growth percentile, they call it. It's a it's change in, in the, the testing for that cohort right. of kids. Um, this was something that was in vogue when the law was passed, these value-added models. It actually was required in the past by the federal government. Everyone across the country is walking back from this. Hold on one second. Was this from the so-called, quote, no child left behind? Um, the in-between uh, Okay, there's policy. so many. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> there's so, so many, the, the latest slogan, mm -hmm, but go right. ahead. So um, when the latest version of the federal uh, education law was adopted, they took that out. Why? Because these value-added models have essentially been debunked as uh, really kind of uh, bogus science. I mean, how you measure a teacher based on student standardized test performance? Exactly. And everyone from the PARC consortium to the company that created PARC has said that the test was never designed to be used this way. And so the commissioner correctly said, okay. Commissioner of Education. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, correctly said, I have the authority to establish uh, what percentage of the evaluation uh, this will be. I'm going to set it at the lowest possible what is percentage. Five percent is what he what said. What was it? At. It was thirty. From thirty percent to five percent? Yes. And all of the research backs this up. He made an absolutely correct judgment about that. He also points out that only 17% of our teachers have this baked into their evaluations. And he correctly focused on the disequity that exists when you do that to just one in six teachers. Let me ask you about this. Mm -hmm. How important is this, Maria? You've oh, been in the classroom. Extreme. Look, I've been 30 years in the yeah, classroom. Tell folks real quick. I uh, taught the last 20 years at high school in Washington Township in Gloucester County. Prior to that, taught in Camden County, K-8 district. Spent some time with middle school students, a little bit with elementary. You know teaching. I do. What about yeah. these tests? Uh, they absolutely need to go. Uh, we are supportive of any testing. And as somebody else has said uh, better than I have said, teachers invent a test. So testing is not the issue. Standardized testing? Standardized testing is still has, is still has its place in our assessment system. Absolutely. But, Park, but no? it does not have a, it does not have a connection to what we do in the classroom. So you ask me, what do we do in the classroom? I assessed kids every single day, multiple pass. I watched kids. I asked questions of kids. My idea and my focus to test a kid was not to catch a kid, but whether to see whether that child was learning the concept of where I needed him to be. If not, I was able to mm. readjust my teaching right then and there. And what she's Real saying quick, is... One more topic to bring up. Go ahead. Okay, what she's saying is so important because the Department of Education has proposed regulations to the State Board of Education mm -hmm. that will dramatically scale back the footprint of testing, uh, standardized testing. But one of the things that's ignored in that proposal is it will require timely reporting of those standardized test results to teachers and to parents for the first time. So we will all get to see... Are kids doing well, and in what areas do we need to try to uh, improve we'll what we're this. doing? Real quick, before I let you out of here, we only have a few seconds left. School consolidation. Um, uh, say Senate uh, President Steve Sweeney is going to be here in just a little bit, talking about his recommendations uh, that came from a task force. Okay, let's consolidate schools. We've Real always quick. said school consolidation should be with uh, the buy-in and agreement of all the stakeholders at the local level, should including be mandated our members. By the state? I don't think that's a reasonable approach. Um, yeah. uh, our, our voters, our parents, and our educators need to weigh in on whether it makes sense. And whether it's good for students. That should be the number one exactly. question. How is this going to affect our children? Marie Bliston, Ed Richardson, the New Jersey Education Association. I want to thank you for joining us on State. Thank you for thank having you, us. It. Anytime. Pleasure. Stay back. <laughs> no, I'll stay here. You come back. We'll see you after this. I, I, it's only 30 years. I can get this right. <laughs> <laughs> To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to be joined once again by Dr. Robert Hodson, president and founder of uh, Road to Recovery. Good to see you, Bob. You too, Steve. I think Thanks. It's four or five times you've been with us. Yep. Your expertise, you're a former priest. Yes. You understand the uh, sex abuse scandal in the priesthood better than anyone else in the Catholic Church. We just had Senator Joseph Vitale check out that interview, who is calling for a uh, 
grand jury investigation, the attorney general in the state of New Jersey doing the same thing into this case. Pennsylvania did, as you called it, what? I called some, uh, Philadelphia, or Pennsylvania, rather, a seminal study, seminal grand jury investigation. Because? Well, it, it left no stone unturned. It, it really looked into the depths of the crisis there. And found? And found 1,000 victims and 300 priests. And since the report was issued, hundreds have come forward to that same hotline. What do we need to do in New Jersey? <clears throat> By the way, New Jersey has a hotline. Check out our site. And Jackie, let's make sure we get that uh, website up because people, dozens and hundreds of people are calling the Attorney General's website yes. uh, hotline on this. Yeah, I applaud uh, Attorney General Graywall for doing this. Uh, it has to be done. I've called for it for decades. Uh, as an insider for over 40 years in the church, I kind of knew what was going on there. And um, I know, you know, I was kind of like a voice in the wilderness for a while, mm. but now people are listening, and that's, it's what has to be done. You know, it's interesting. I have never said this on the air before, but Ted McCarrick, um, the Archbishop of the Archdiocese I grew up in, um, elevated since then in the Catholic Church, in Metuchen, Archbishop there as well, he was an important uh, figure in my life, my family's life. He was a spiritual advisor in my family. Yeah. Tell folks what he did. Well, Ted McCarrick ordained Allegedly me. Allegedly did. Well, he ordained me to the priesthood in 1997, but in 1994... Well, he did do that. Yeah. What, what was the word for a long time, according to many in the uh, church? Well, before we knew about his pedophilic behavior, we knew that he was sleeping with seminarians, and he would invite seminarians en masse to his Jersey Shore house in Seagirt, and he would always be one bed short, and someone would have to sleep with him. Uh, I'm currently working with a priest in Metuchen who... Uh, is still attempting to recover from all this. Bob, who knew about this in the church hierarchy? Everybody knew about it, Steve. Did now, the Pope know about it? I believe the Pope knew about it. You don't know, it. you think. I believe the Pope knew about it. I believe the Cardinals knew about it. There wasn't anybody who didn't hear about Theodore McCarrick's antics. Theodore McCarrick was a seminar. giant in the Catholic Church. Yeah. No yeah. one touched it. No one took it on. No, 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 because McCarrick was such a charismatic figure in many ways. He, he, you know, he was very socially... Uh, adept, you know. Politically he, active. Politically engaged, active. Engaged, connected. Engaged, right. When we, we've been trying to get the Child Victims Act passed in New Jersey, he called every legislator and told them not to do it, uh, and they believed him. He had juice, as we like to say, That's in New Jersey. Absolutely. And where are we now with him? Well, he's, he's now a disgraced figure. He's living on his, you know, by himself, and he will not get a... he will not get a cardinal's funeral. He will barely get a priest's funeral, if, if that. Too little, too late? Oh, much too little too late. You know, in 94, when I applied to become a priest here, uh, I asked the question, is McCarrick still sleeping with the seminarians? What? Oh, yes, in 94. Uh, it was McCarrick who... 24 years ago as we do this program. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, McCarrick asked me to speak to Monsignor Bill Fedrowski, who at that time was the head of catechetics for the archdiocese, because he had a similar story to me. I, he had been a brother. I was a brother. So he said, why don't you talk to Bill? My first question as we met in a little Spanish restaurant in Harrison was, Bill, has McCarrick stopped sleeping with the seminarians? I was afraid that I might be sucked into that because I had been abused yeah. previously as an Irish Christian brother. By the way, I was trained by the Irish Christian brothers, as you well know, at Essex right. Catholic and later at Iona. I too. Oh, yeah. boy. Um, what do we need to do right now? Got a couple minutes left. What do we really need to do? Get action. We need to hold these dioceses accountable. Uh, the, the attorney general in Pennsylvania had, had a great, uh, has a great plan, had a great plan, and, and did it. When he had to raid diocese files, he did it. Uh, if do we need to, does the attorney general in New Jersey need to be raiding files of diocese offices? I, I believe he does because we have what is called secret files, and those secret files contain the most important information. For the most part. What about the statute of limitations? We have to get rid of the statute of limitations and hopefully do our best getting rid of it. There shouldn't be any statute of limitations on murder of the soul. We don't have it on murder of the body. Yeah. We shouldn't have it on murder Minute of the left. soul. What does Road to Recovery do? We work with sexual abuse victims and their families. We worked with over. We have worked with over 5,000 victims since 2003. 5,000. Yeah, N internationally. Church says, "Trust us on this. We'll handle it ourselves." No, the church cannot be trusted. It's been proven, clearly proven. One more question that's personal for me and, and more personal for many watching. Folks say, I'm torn by going to church because I don't know where that money's going. I, it's hard for me to listen to a priest who's up there speaking because I don't know if he, in fact, 
was either engaged directly or was complicit in the process. Is that some wacky thinking? Well, I feel for the people because I don't think they should give up their faith. Right. As I tell people, my faith has never been stronger. Faith in the church? Right. My religion has never been weaker, however, because I, I have a hard time dealing with those who are attempting to lead us in this religion. Uh, so what I would suggest to those folks is hold your church accountable, but continue, of course, to nourish yourself spiritually. Bob Oates and uh, Rotary Cover, and thank you for joining us. Thanks, Steve. Keep doing what you're right. doing to help yeah, a we'll whole do. range of people who have been victims and should never have been in the first place. We'll be right back after this. Thank you. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, Ph.D. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are pleased to be joined by State Assemblywoman Eliana Pinter Marin, who is chair of the Assembly Budget Committee. Good to see you, my friend. Nice to see you, Steve. How are you? I, I'm great. I heard we are rolling in dough in the <laughs> State House. You don't even know what to do with the money. Is that true or is that fake news? That's fake news. You must be talking about another state. <laughs> what is the truth? Um, the truth tight? is, yes. I think it's been like this now. We've been talking about this issue for quite a few years. Um, when we're starting to have a little bit more of a restriction on the general fund, um, you start trying to identify areas that maybe you can cut and certain programs that we have to make sustainable. Let's so, make it clear. I'm sorry for interrupting. The assemblyman is actually the chief person, the head person in the lower house in the state assembly dealing with all finance budget issues. Um, you have you listen to people come and talk about, hey, you need to state needs to support our program. We're doing important things or people who are suffering and you want to be responsive. But we have a massive fiscal problem. State Senate President Steve Sweeney who's actually coming on right after you says, you know what? We need to stop talking about raising taxes. We need to consider consolidating school districts and other communities. Um, and we need to deal with major additional cuts in health and pension benefits. For public employees, you say? So this this uh, uh, comes from our fiscal task force policy yep. did that you participate we in it? I did I did I okay. participate on it with the Senate President, um, and obviously there was a group of ideas that you know um, policy analysts, ec uh, economists, uh, all of them uh, came together and identified quite a few areas that the state should look at and really consider uh, doing. Obviously, a lot of it is bold, uh, tough decisions. Uh, but I think that we're taking a look at some of these to see what, what can really what work. What happens if we do nothing? I think that that's not, we just can't afford to not do anything. Well, what would happen? Uh, well, as I said earlier, our general fund is becoming more and more restrictive. Uh, we really can't afford to pay more taxes. And uh, we want to be able to keep our good New Jerseyans here and our college and people graduate from we're our colleges them. and stay here. We're losing them? We're losing them. Why? Like, why, why would someone, I mean, you're born and raised in this community, on board, like, we're not going anywhere. We're not the norm, are we? No, we're not the norm. But I also say that, you know, I think that more and more millennials are choosing to stay here in the sense mm. that uh, New Jersey is a, a great place to migrate to. Uh, we have trains, we have buses, we're so close to New York City. Uh, we have the best education system uh, nationwide, right? I think we're second. And uh, we just have to make sure that we can afford to live here. And I think that has become our biggest problem, is the affordability. Did you, when Governor Murphy and Steve Sweeney, the Senate President, were having spirited discussions, um, why are you laughing? Uh, had spirited, candid discussions behind the scenes on how to handle his budget, in all seriousness. Mm -hmm. A lot of Democrats were reluctant to want to increase any taxes. And the governor said, look, we have no choice. We have to increase taxes on the wealthiest New Jerseyans. I believe it was a millionaire's tax. I believe what was agreed to was over $5 million, Assemblywoman, that the increase would be, I guess, from 8.75 to, I'm not sure what the number 10. is. 10.75. What is it? To now 10.75. You say? Was that the right thing to do? So I think that at the end, we all wanted to have a fair and fiscal budget. I think that our main differences were really how do we get there. Fundamentally, we believed and the legislative add-ons, a lot of the programs that still exist today. Um, 
and I think that the five million piece was a good compromise, right? It's about compromise. Uh, I think that the Senate president and the speaker, which was very important for them, and speaker obviously, Craig Coughlin. right, and especially for my district as well, school funding. We put in a lot of money into school funding. We're really why that matters. That. So, why does that matter so much? And you know, education more than more. She served on the uh, board of education as well. Yes. So why does it matter so much? It matters school so funding. It matters so much because we have to find a way to start relieving some of that burden, not only on the state but also on families that live uh, in New Jersey. And increasing that funding level, which... From the should... state to local school districts. Yes. And um, I think that, you know, in doing so, you're keeping our treasure, right? You're keeping what we uh, tout nationwide, which is our education system. Um, and you see that with even the preschool uh, funding, additional money that we put in there as well. Because you want to be able to maintain families here. You want to be able to tell people, why, do, why move away when we have everything that we need here? One more quick question um, on, on funding and kids and topic you care deeply about. Uh, an initiative we are doing is called Right From The Start NJ. The website will be put up as we speak, dealing with infants and toddlers and mm. the need to take care of those children and also moms, prenatal care, et cetera, et cetera. Are we doing enough? No. What should we do? So here comes back to our funding issue, right? Um, we have places in the state of New Jersey where we have deserts, I like to call them, um, of child care. And that's mm. from zero to three. Deserts of child care. Yes. Um, and that's because we don't have uh, enough of them. And the places that we do have that are very good, obviously, for low-income moms, um, it's very hard to be able to send your child to a great... Too expensive. Yeah, way too expensive. So what's the role of the state in this? How can the state help? Well, we did the child dependency tax, uh, which was one way to try to help alleviate. And I think that from this budget moving forward, it's about creativity. It's about where we can tweak um, some of the costs, what we can be creative in uh, creating sustainable revenue and new revenue. You know, we saw this, uh, it was kind of like the hallelujah, I like to, I like to call it, of the, um, the sales tax, the internet sales tax come into play. Um, now we're talking about legalizing uh, marijuana, not only the, the medical side, but the recreational side. Should, excuse me, Assemblywoman. Uh, should some of those dollars, in a few seconds we have left, some of those dollars be dedicated to the early childhood issues that we're talking about, zero to three? Why not? Absolutely. If we, say, we often say they're our most precious resource, our children. Do we back it up? I think we do to a certain point, but not enough. And I think that this whole uh, child care piece has really been talked about within the last couple of years, and people are finally paying attention to it. I'm a mom of two young girls, mm. um, six and two. Beautiful. And, and I'm very fortunate. I have grandma and grandpa that are retired and help out tremendously. Not everyone has that. And not everyone has that. Not this everyone is personal has that. for you, isn't it? It is personal, because we want to make not only our children succeed, but we want to make our parents be happy, our constituents happy, and say, you know what, I love the state of New Jersey. Assemblyman, I want to thank you so much for joining us on State of Affairs. Come back anytime. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Thank you very much. Stay right there. This is State of Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato. We'll catch you next time. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Agnes Veris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway. Funding has been provided by Englewood Health, the Northward Center, Rowan University, New Jersey Resources, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey, and by International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825. Promotional support provided by The Record, North Jersey's trusted source, and NorthJersey.com. And by Commerce and Industry Association of New Jersey. Choosing a new family doctor can be confusing. Check with your health insurer to see which physicians near you participate with your plan. Find out which hospitals the doctor uses and who covers when the doctor is away. And remember to schedule an appointment with your new doctor in advance to fill out any paperwork without the added stress of being sick. I could feel my lungs fill with oxygen and I got my life back. The Sharon Eric means to me hope, life, 
and everything. The Sharing Network was a lifeline to me when I really needed it. We are an organ procurement organization. The core purpose of the New Jersey Sharing Network is to save and enhance lives. To honor those who gave. A tribute to those who received. Offer hope to those who continue to wait. And remember the lives lost while waiting. For the gift of life.